Hello, everybody, and welcome or welcome back to The Second Shelf and to the tops and flops of the month of February. If you are new to my channel, first of all, happy to have you um, uh, and not familiar with this series uh, at the end of each month, I look back at my reading and then I film a video about three books that I thought were for various reasons in the tops category and mostly two, sometimes one, but mostly two books that I thought weren't that successful and they go in the flops category. But we begin with the tops as always. And as always within the tops, we begin with the book that I thought about the most. And it might be a bit unfair in a way because it was a reread and I already knew that I loved the book, but still, it was just, again, the third reread, uh, I think, but I'm, yeah. Anyway, I should tell you about the book. <laughs> it's Ursula Le Guin, The Lathe of Heaven, first published in 1971, I think. Um... <laughs> yes, 1971. And I read this as a buddy read with Adam uh, from Memento Mori. As you know, if you follow my channel, uh, Adam and I are making, slowly but surely, making our way through Ursula Le Guin's work. Um, not all of the short stories, I think, but the novels and some short story collections or novellas. And our read for February was obviously this one. And it was a reread. I said that already for me. Um, the book, uh, the premise of the book is actually quite simple. Uh, uh, it's set in the future from the perspective of the 1971 uh, year when it was published. So it's, I think it's the early 20, uh, 21st century or something. Um, and our main character is George Orr. Um, and he has a problem. Uh, he can have effective dreams, as he calls them. So he can dream something and it actually happens and not um, in the future. Uh, so not if you dream you win a lottery, tomorrow you will win the lottery. No, but it, it changes the past. So in other words, if he dreams that he uh, uh, wins the lottery, he will have won the lottery yesterday and that will also affect his whole past and the past of the world. Uh, the lottery uh, example is not in the book. It's just as an illustration. So he really wants to get rid of that. He doesn't like it that his dreams affect the world. Um, and he is drawing, uh, you know, sleep deprivation. He's drawing tr drugs to suppress dreams and the drug abuse. Um, that's the, the, the story angle. Um, he has to, because of the drug abuse, he has to go mandatory, um, to psychoanalysis or to see a shrink, basically. Uh, and that shrink is Dr. Haber. And Dr. Haber, um, that is, it, it's not a spoiler because it's, clear very early on um, because he uh, induces sleep through hy hy hypnosis in order to, you know, help uh, uh, George get rid of the dream, so to speak. Um, I mean, Haber doesn't know. Of course, George doesn't tell him about the effectiveness of his dreams. Nobody would believe him anyway. But the point is that Haber, because he is present uh, when George sleeps, he also experiences um, the change because the, the thing, of course, is that only George knows about the change. He can remember the previous past. Everybody else uh, uh, is just living the new life. But Haber, because he's present um, when George dreams, he can also remember the past. And he thinks this is a perfect tool to make the world a better place. And then the story takes off from there. Um, so this is a book um, that has a lot of uh, philosophical or uh, uh, political thinking in it. You know, is it, do the, the means justify the end? If you try to make the world a better place, can you also kill off six billion people? in, <laughs> you know, while you make the world a better place. So 
the the way this book makes you think and it also telling a fantastic story i think is is just wonderful it's one of my favorite le guin books and it's it shows you if you have a topic that you want to address uh, but you don't want to write an essay this is the way to do it um, last sunday i reviewed the african a story of an african farm which also has a lot of topical issues that the author clearly wanted to discuss, but she didn't um, succeed in doing it while telling a story. So yeah, this is definitely the book that I thought about, about the most, and it won't be the last time I reread it. It's fantastic. Um, then the best nonfiction book, um, I can be brief. I didn't read that much nonfiction, and the pick was easy. Uh, Eleanor Clackhorn, Unwell Women, published um, two years ago. And I talked about this book already extensively, so I'm not going to spend more time or much more time on it. It's a journey through medicine and the myth, uh, medicine and myth in a man made world. And man made, not human, but man made. So literally, it takes a look from antiquity until uh, after the Second World War of how women's bodies and women's illnesses were treated or how women were regarded or considered to be ill, quote unquote, because of some um, weird, twisted way that male medicine looked at the female body. It's really, really infuriating at times, but it's a fantastic um, overview. It's really well written. It's engaging. If you're interested at all in that topic to learn more about, you know, medicine and the female body through time, I can highly, highly recommend this one. It was a really good read. And it was, a, um, I think I'd, I said that when I hauled the book, uh, when I bought it, it was, um, I found it by, by chance. I just saw, uh, I think on Amazon even, uh, I saw the book and I thought, I've never heard of it. And I thought that sounds interesting and it was absolutely worthwhile. The last in the tops, as always, is the book that surprised me the most. And if you follow the tops and flops, you know that the surprise can be anything. Um, that I expected something different or didn't expect to like it or um, was surprised by how much the book explored a certain topic. It can be anything. The, the book that surprised me the most was a debut novel, um, These Ghosts Are Family by Macy Card, uh, published a couple of years ago. Mm, let me check. Uh, 2020. So two years, yeah, three years ago. It's 2023. Um, and I had this on my shelf for a while. Um, and I read it last month also for my uh, Global South Challenge. Um, I want to read more books from the what so-called Global South. So the formerly developing countries kind of, uh, it's not a geographical term. I said that already many times. Um, and I'm focusing at the moment on Iran and the Caribbean. And this is an author from the Caribbean, from Jamaica. She lives in New York, I think at the uh, moment, but she is from uh, Jamaica and the book is set for a big portion. It's set on Jamaica. Why did it surprise me? Because it was a completely different book from what I thought it would be. Because the blurb says, uh, Stanford Solomon's um, shocking 35-year-old secret is about to change the lives of everyone around him. He is a man who faked his own death and stole the identity of his best friend, Stanford Solomon, and he is actually Abel Paisley. So I thought, and that's how the book opens, when uh, Abel Paisley, a.k.a. Solomon Stanford, uh, decides to tell his former family, because he had a wife and a child, and his current family after his second wife died, he also has children there, that he actually was someone else. For a long time. So I expected this kind of family saga and I was mildly interested. I'm not a huge multi-generational family saga type of reader. I mainly, like I said, picked the book because of you know, the author's um, Caribbean heritage and because I want to read more books set 
in the Caribbean and written by Caribbean authors. This book was not that. I mean, the blurb is really, really misleading. It opens with that, but then you get this really fantastic look at family history from um, slavery and how that affected the family tree. You get various uh, members of the family um, and their life and how certain events in the past or the heritage affected their lives. So this this story about uh, Abel slash Solomon is just one aspect of this whole book. It's not the main theme even. I mean, it it is recurring because, of course, it has influence on his uh, children's lives, and but it's not the center of the book. The center of the book is um, how our personal but also historical heritage forms and informs what we are as people and as family. I thought it was fabulous. As a debut novel, it was astounding um, that somebody could write a first book this good and this, the command um, over the story and the characters, I thought was just absolutely fabulous. So yeah, I'm really, really glad that I finally got around reading this book. So these are my three tops. Uh, on to the flops and fair warning. Um, unpopular opinion coming up because both books that are in my flops are books that are really, really hailed as fantastic all over BookTube and everywhere else as well. So if you love any of these two books, fantastic for you, but they didn't work for me. And the first one uh, was a buddy read with Heidi from my reading life, and we read Babel, uh, an arcane history by, where's the name here, Rebecca F. Huang. Uh, Rebecca F. Huang is a um, uh, Chinese-American writer. She wrote another fantasy series, The Poppy Wars, that topic didn't interest me, so I never read any of that. Uh, but this... Um, the premise of this book really grabbed me. Um, it's set in London slash Oxford uh, in the 1860s um, in, um, uh, and they're in an alternate version of Oxford because you have this a school, Babel, uh, where you learn a translation. It's all about translating and it is about a certain type of magic. If you have silver, you can um, affect the world. Uh, if you have two words in two different languages, um, it affects how um, the person you're talking to or the world in general. So you can actually um, magically change the world with the help of this metal, silver, and the power of translation. So that's the premise. And then we follow, it's dark academia. We follow four uh, people. And the main character uh, is, I'm forgetting all the names again, Robin. Uh, he is from China uh, and he is brought to Oxford by uh, Professor Lowell, and we will learn about their relationship later in the book. And in Oxford, in Babel, uh, this uh, translation school, uh, Robin meets um, uh, Rami uh, from India, uh, Victoire from Haiti, and Letty, uh, uh, who is the only uh, white girl in the group. Uh, she is from England. And those four uh, pupils, we follow their story and uh, we learn about the dark sides of the use of this metal, especially uh, politically from the point of England, colonialism, you know, the way other countries and peoples are abused. So that setting really intrigued me and I thought it was fascinating. Everything with language fascinates me. Duh. Um, but 
Uh, first of first of all, the pacing was completely off. I thought um, there is there was no arc, you know that that in in these fantasy books where you go on a quest and this is a quest about what to do to do the right thing. Robin in particular, um, and then it goes to the climactic uh, event, and then you have maybe a little epilogue or something. But this book goes up and down and up and down. Um, and it doesn't build up, for me, it didn't build up any tension. Um, and the second thing was that the, it was way too long. It's a huge book. Um, that didn't help with the pacing. Uh, it was very repetitive about uh, the, the use of translation and the use of the silver. Um, it had, um, the characters did things that were completely out of character and they needed to do that. That was clear. Otherwise the story would not go anywhere. And that is a, a real, um, yeah, a real pet peeve of mine. If I can see the author thinking, oh, gee, I need this character to go to Walmart. He never shops at Walmart, but I really need him there and I'm not going to explain why he does this. I'm just going to let him do it because I need him at this place. Something is happening there. That's just poor plotting and poor writing in my opinion. So the, the premise was good, but the pacing didn't work for me. I was bored uh, in the middle when it dragged on and on and on. There is also a really huge conflict, almost a war-like scenario. Um, and that didn't, she didn't convey, the book didn't convey any tension. Um, but people were mostly bored. They were sitting around talking while all hell broke loose outside. So that didn't work for me either. So unfortunately, uh, like I said, if it worked for you, perfect, happy for you. But for me, it didn't work. And the second book uh, that didn't work for me was uh, sci-fi-ish, kind of. And that is also a very um, uh, loved book and praised book. And that is The Sea of Tranquility by Emily uh, uh, St. John Mandel, uh, published, I think, last year or the year before that, um, uh, 2022, yeah, last year. Uh, the, again, the premise of the book was really intriguing. Uh, it, it is basically about time travel. And we start uh, in, in the US uh, in the 1900, uh, 19th century, and we go all the way to, I think, the 25th century or something. And there is some portal uh, involved and yeah, that, that sounded intriguing, but again, it was just meh. Uh, the story development with this idea of time travel, time travel books are tricky. Uh, if you want to read a good time travel book, try, um, The Wrinkle of Time by Madeline Lengel or try Annalie uh, Newitz, uh, The Other Time, what's the title of the book again? Sorry, The Future of Another Timeline, which was published 2019. They really could um, make sense with time travel because there are a lot of issues with the whole time traveling thing. The main premise of the book or the main story about whether or not to change the past, whether that is a good idea, is not new. Uh, the solution was like, yeah, okay, uh, you know, why this portal existed. And uh, there were a lot of uh, plot elements uh, mentioned or started, but they were not followed through. It was just not interesting as a book for me. But again, a lot of people loved it. Uh, a lot of people who I normally agree uh, on, uh, uh, agree with, loved the book. So don't take my word for it. Give it a try if you haven't, if you're interested in time travel. But for me, it didn't work. It was just a very, very meh, uninteresting book, unfortunately. Anyway, these were my tops and flops of the month of February. Uh, 20 minute video. Sorry about that. Uh, but you always tell me you don't mind. 
Thank you very much for watching till the end. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Looking forward to your comments as always, and I'll see you all soon in the next one.